All right, so good uh, morning here. This is uh, Sunday School here, Acts chapter 12, finally. Acts chapter 12, part uh, 1. This is going to be a very interesting, probably a more in-depth study than we uh, typically do. Uh, even more in-depth because we are, we're going to have to run a lot of verses. Um, the big issue that we're going to be discussing in Acts chapter 12 here in the beginning is the, the topic of who is James? So obviously the James in, in Acts chapter number 12 is a little easier to delineate and define. But then after that point, uh, we're going to see a James in Acts chapter 15. And then we're also going to see a James who writes the book of James. And there's some uh, very important reasons why we need to understand this. Because what it does is it gives us and provides us with a bigger picture. This isn't making a, something out of nothing. Again, uh, God's word records information for the purpose of us to know it. So if he didn't put all these things like James, the son of Alphaeus, well, then it wasn't necessary. If you know, if you follow me, what I'm saying, he put that there. He put the delineation. He put those surnames there for a reason. And that is for us to understand and study and to read it and to, and to get it. So this is going to be. A, a somewhat of a complex study. I just want to put that out there. What I want to do in the study as well is I, I want to be sure that I don't put my bias on the verses uh, at all. I really want to kind of give you the verses, go through all of them, leave things in somewhat of an open-ended manner in the beginning. I will obviously give you a conclusion. I don't preach not to a conclusion, uh, you know, usually. But uh, probably not today. I won't give you a conclusion. I'm just going to give you some things to think about, some verses to run and verses to read. Because I've been looking at this uh, for a while. Russ and I had gone over it for a little bit. I went back and studied it again. I actually heard a grace preacher preach on it recently and um, really not do a very good job and give me some really interesting points that I was like, no, nah, I don't know where you're going with that, but okay. you know. And that happens a lot of times. Uh, but we're going to really break it all down for you. So... Uh, hopefully I'm back for good for a little while here. I went on that cruise ship and got, you know, who knows what it was called, some crazy virus. Uh, and I'm feeling better now, which is good. We had the cruise uh, for a week, and then I got back, and then I got sick. And, you know, it's, it's like having two weeks off of work, which I never planned for. Uh, then we had the conference on uh, yesterday. That was good. We'll have those messages posted here very soon. We had a decent showing of uh, individuals, and I think the messages were all uh, well received. And, and prepared so uh, I'm glad to be back hopefully I can get back into the swing of things into a routine I'm a very routine oriented person so when I don't have my routines I get I get pouty face so uh, Acts chapter 12 please look there in uh, verse number 1 Acts 12 verse 1 it says now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church and he killed James the brother of John with the sword and because he saw it pleased the Jews he proceeded further to take Peter also then were the days of unleavened bread and when he had apprehended him he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people this is really the third martyr that we have seen uh, for you know, Christ. The first martyr, of course, is, is Jesus Christ himself. I mean, he faced the death, the crucifixion of the cross. It was one that uh, obviously is, uh, is the worst death, but you know, any death is a bad death, especially when you're being killed uh, simply for not renouncing your faith. You know? uh, these people are not violent. They are not uh, trying to overthrow the government. Uh, the biggest issue is they're simply preaching truth and getting killed for it. You know, a martyr is someone who is killed or murdered for their faith. And usually the option is given to that person to either recant, right, renounce, or die or burn at the stake. Do we have to experience anything even remotely close to that today? Not, not even close. I mean, not even close. Nobody's ever, you know, been tied up to the stake and the fire starts to be lit. And, oh, hurry up. You better renounce or else you're going to burn to death. I mean, to, to just, to, just to think about that for a minute, uh, you know, they always say burning to death is one of the worst ways to die, you know. Uh, and if you go through the Fox's Book of Martyrs, which I think many of us have looked at or gone through through the years, you know, so many of them face that type of horrific death. I'm not a Greek individual, but I looked up the word martyr, and it originally meant, it's very interesting, it originally meant 
Uh, it wasn't a negative word, right? It wasn't a negative word to use the word martyr. It was meant to bring testimony or to bear witness. So if you martyred, it was to bring testimony to bear witness. And I think that's very interesting. And that the term martyr actually developed into a term about uh, persecution for religion, so to speak, uh, with the death of followers of Christ. That's uh, pretty interesting how that word is, has done. You know, dying for the faith is something that is, is, I think is hard to relate to. I really think we have a tough time relating to that. We read it, and we, we read about it, and we read about you know the death of Stephen, or read about you know uh, these other deaths, and, and you know John the Baptist, as we'll see. And, but you know, kind of like reading, like okay, and we see death all the time. We watch a movie, and there's you know eight thousand people dying in three hundred. You know, I mean, it's like you, you watch a movie, you don't really fully comprehend the, the, what these people did. They're sacrificing their life and this is why so many people, you know, again, C.S. Lewis is another guy I like to talk about. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of him in all regards but, you know, he was uh, kind of a, um, a brainiac in some ways but he said, you know, one of another me, ra- main reason why I, I found validity in Christianity is that so many would die for the faith, you know. People don't do that, you know. Uh, they're not going to die for a lie. They're going to die for something that they, you know, really... Uh, believe in and and you know people would say well, what about Islam? Well, it's a little bit different. They're killing themselves. <laughs> you follow me? What I'm saying versus uh, Christianity, where they're not violent. They're they're being killed. So you know, sure we suffer you know plenty of persecution, uh, but the time has not yet come that any of us would face death for being a believer of the gospel or being a faithful witness. But of the martyrs that we've seen thus far, we have number one, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, he faced the death of the cross. He was obedient to do that. Uh, Obviously, we'll look at uh, John the Baptist in a little bit when we're discussing these Herods, because this is important too. We have to look at who the Herods are, who the Jameses are, and then who all the Marys are. So, (laughs) it's like, come on guys, couldn't you find some different names, you know? Why do you got to be called Herod and Mary and James? I mean, we got a jillion names out there, and you guys are all going by the same. This, the, really, the first martyr that we have in, in, uh, in the book of Acts, who is that first martyr? Who, do you remember who that is? Stephen. Stephen's the very first martyr. If you look at uh, Acts chapter number uh, 8, please. Acts chapter number 8. What I want to show you is that you know, the martyring of, of Stephen and how it was transpired right, was propagated and done by Jews, right? Was it not? Yes. So what we'll see too is that Herod, this Herod that we'll read about in Acts chapter 12, which we'll d- define who that is. Is this the Herod in Matthew 2? Is this the Herod in Matthew 14? Is this the Herod in, you know, which, which Herod is this? We'll go through that as well. But you have to remember that these Jews, while, while Herod does the, you know, the persecuting, he's doing this for the purpose that it did what? That it pleased the Jews. I mean, people get excited and happy that you kill somebody. I mean, again, I want you to think about that. I want you to actually, like, you know, process that in your brain that people are excited to kill another person, you know? And these are people who are, who again, when Christ says he came into his own and his own received him not, he came into his own, his own received him not, his own killed and killed and killed. You know, when you read through that uh, uh, verse back there in, in Matthew chapter number 23, when he says, uh, you know, you are, you are of your father, you know, he says, verse 23, verse 31, and he said, read very 24, verse number 30. He says, and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers of with them in the blood of the prophets. Christ is saying, you can't say that. Don't say you want to be partakers of the blood of the prophets. Don't try to distance yourself from your viper lineage. He says, wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. That's who you are. And he says, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape what? The damnation of hell. And this is a very interesting verse because he says here in verse number 34, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. This was foretold. The martyrdom was foretold. Jesus Christ foretold it so much that he says, look, here's the deal, guys. I don't want you to be offended. I don't want you to get offended when I tell you this. I don't want you to get offended when they kick you out of the synagogue. And I don't want you to get offended when you're disowned by people who you think, you know, you should be associated with. They think, you know, to be accepted by the Jews is a good thing. Those are God's people. This is a... No. Those 
are the generation of vipers. You see that from the very beginning in Matthew 3, that big distinction there between uh, believing Israel and unbelieving Israel. Okay? That's all throughout the scripture. You always are going to see believing and unbelieving Israel. You know, in Acts chapter number 7 and verse number 54, after he had, really it's verse 53, you know, go, go to verse number 51, he says this, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. Okay, and so what he's doing is he's showing them again, as your fathers did, this is Acts 7, 51, he says, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? Is that in line with the words of Jesus Christ? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you got to remember that Stephen has a picture of the Holy Ghost. Okay, when he preaches, when he's teaching, he's preaching and teaching the Word of God. Stephen did not come in and, and, and as I said before, prepare the message. He didn't prepare it. He didn't go, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna hit him real hard with this one. Where I go, you have not kept the law. You know, I'm gonna. No, he doesn't even. He's not even doing that. This is the Spirit explaining this through him, which in reality is who? It's just is just God in Christ. It's Christ just going up and speaking to him, and that's why it really pierces him so hard. And he says, "Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they have slain them, which show before of the coming of the just one, of whom have been now the." You, you have now been the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. You know why they were cut? Is was truth. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. Of course, they contradicted. I'm sure they blasphemed. I'm sure they said, we are the circumcision. We are the religious elite. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heaven opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. Stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. You know, Stoning is not a thing that is, uh, you know, you don't pick up little pebbles either, you know. It's not like we pick up little tiny pebbles and we throw them. Um, I'll, I'll tell you this, hopefully you don't get offended, but uh, while I was in the police academy, we had to watch um, the most grotesque things that you could possibly imagine. Uh, the reason why they do that is it's a desensitization. Desensitiz desensitization. So I don't think I've ever said that word before, first time for everything. Uh, and what they're trying to do is they're, they're trying to uh, remove what is natural in you. So when you see death, you, it's something that frightens you. You see death, it's something that takes you back, right? You see violence, it's something that makes you get your adrenaline, it gets you fearful. What they want you to do is to be able to be calm and reserved in any type of situation, right? And so, I mean, I'll tell you, we, we would watch stoning videos from Afghanistan watch videos from the people underneath Islam or whatever they would they would bury them you know up to their waist or up to their chest and they would get big old boulders and just I mean they would chuck them on these guys heads and you watch the heads just go like this I mean it's a horrible horrible thing and you don't really comprehend and think how horrible this really was to have the death of stoning is I mean that's why you read the Fox's Book of Martyrs and you go man all these people did all this for what for some book and some words really yeah, what that does to me, doesn't it? Doesn't it help increase your faith? It does me. Absolutely. I look at it and go, this just this just proves the truth even more. This stoning that accomplished with, you know, uh, Stephen was done by the Jews, and they did it because it pleased them. It, they did it because they wanted to do it. They, they enjoyed this. They wanted to kill this guy. And as we'll see in a minute, that Christ prophesied and said, whoever, whoever uh, they kill, they think that they'll be doing God, what? Service. How, how naive and how, how ignorant could they be? When they stoned Stephen, he says, he calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice. I love how he says it. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge, right? It's very similar to that, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They got no clue what they're doing. The devil was working in them like you wouldn't believe. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So we saw Jesus Christ, his crucifixion. We didn't go over any verses. We know that very well. We see Stephen. We see his stoning. We see his persecution done by the Jews. And then we get over here to the book of Acts chapter 12, and we see 
we see another dad. We see James. And it says, Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. He wanted to kill people. This guy, Herod, is a very interesting character. And we're going to study this in just a second. We'll figure out who all these people are. But, you know, when James gets, you know, vexed by the hand of Herod, this isn't something that he's not prepared for, right? This isn't, this isn't something that he doesn't know is going to happen. This isn't something where he's like, oh, it's just a total shock that somebody wants to kill me. Somebody's already told him. Christ told him that he was going to die. Look at Matthew chapter number 10. He says, some of you are going to die. <coughs> Matthew chapter 10. When he calls together these apostles... He lists them all out, 10, 1 through 4. When you get down to verse number 16, he says this. He says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake. For a what? For a testimony. For a, for a martyrdom, you know? To be a martyr against these people. To bring a testimony against them and the Gentiles. Verse 19, this shows you again, just like Stephen, he didn't prepare. He says, but when you, they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. And he says, and the brother shall deliver up the brother to death. And the father, the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents. Isn't this exactly the opposite? If you go over to uh, the book of Luke, he's, he's kind of already said this. He said this before that they were going to be divided. Look at Luke chapter number 12 and verse number uh, 52. He already told them that there was going to be a division. Now he's telling them that there's not only just going to be a division, there's also going to be you know, deliverance unto death. Luke 12, verse 52, he says, from, For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two, and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Division inside of Israel. Christ goes on in, in, in Matthew 10, verse 21, he says, And the brother shall deliver up the brother to, to death. And the father, the child, and the children shall rise up. You know what John the Baptist was trying to do? If you look over at the book of Luke in, in the very beginning, chapter number uh, 1. Luke chapter number 1, what he was trying to do is he says here in verse number 16, he says, And many of the children shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to who? To the children. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. All for the purpose of making ready a people prepared for the Lord. The people who were not prepared for the Lord are clearly evident. Clearly seen. From the very beginning they're called that generation of vipers. When he says here that they're going to rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. What is the division about? It's about Jesus Christ. It's about whether or not he is Lord. It's whether or not he's the son of man. It's whether or not he's the son of David. It's whether or not he is God. It's whether or not who he, he says who he says he is. If you look over at Matthew chapter number 24, please. He says the same thing. He says, Verse number 24, verse number 9, he says, Then shall they deliver you up to, the, to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. One more passage on this is John chapter 16. A more intimate warning about the future of of persecution, a more intimate warning about what is going to happen. And in John 16 and verse number 1, Christ tells the apostles this. He says, These things, 
These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you. That when the time shall come, you may be remember that I told you of them. The time came for who? Time came for Stephen. Time came for who? Time came for James. I mean, you got to think about it. You know, things are not going too, too bad. And then all of a sudden, you know, Herod's all ticked and he's going to vex certain of the church. And he gathers together and he grabs James. And then he's like, you know what? Not just James. Let's also get Peter. You know, Peter's got to be thinking to himself, well, I'm dead. I'm dead, right? We'll see how that transpires, but, you know, James knows what's going to happen. And he says, I've told you these things because when the time comes, I want you to remember that I told you them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me whither, whither thou goest thou. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. You know, this is something they were prepared for. Right. <laughs> they were all excited about who they had. Right. Right. He's there, and then all of a sudden, like, well, hold on. I mean, I want to. I want to. I want you here. I want. You. No. I gotta go for a little while. You know, while while we won't experience death, right? At least it's highly unlikely for the cause of Christ. We can and will and do suffer persecution. Most of us feel like we're dead to so many people, right? Sometimes it's due to our doctrine. We then become, you know, enemies, as I've always said. I love that verse. Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Sometimes it's just due to reproof or rebuke about something else. Maybe it's sin. Maybe it's, uh, you know, whatever. But when James is experiencing this persecution from Herod in Acts chapter number 12, he knew it was next. He knew it was coming. And there's not much more we get besides that. It just says he killed them. Whatever Herod wanted to do, Herod did. It wasn't like, like, well, let me just real quick grab my lawyer and have my due process. And No, we just chop your head off. I mean, that's how we, that's how we roll. You know, this line of Herods are some nasty, nasty people. I mean, nasty people. You don't want anything to do. If my name was Herod, I'd change my name. They're so bad. Let's look at the lineage of these kings for a moment and look at the issue. Herod was a name given to those of the, of the rulership or the dynasty of those individuals who were appointed by Rome to govern the area of Judea. And then you'll see a thing called Herod the Tetrarch, and those are like when they broke it up into quarters and that thing. We don't have to get into all the details, but I do want to show you some of these people. So the first Herod that we see is in Matthew chapter number 2. Let's look at this Herod, Matthew 2. Matthew 2. This Herod, if you look at verse number 2, chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, and the days of who? Herod the king. Well, didn't we just read in Acts chapter number 12 that there was a Herod the king? Yes, but this is a long time between, and this Herod has since died, and we'll, we'll go through that in a second. But this Herod here, he's a nasty guy too. He goes over, and once he figures out where, you know, he, he was troubled about where the Christ was going to be born, he goes down in verse number 16 of chapter 2, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. Slew children, babies, and all the coasts thereof from two years old and under. That would be Noah. You're going to kill a little Noah for what reason? Well, because he believed in the validity of the prophecy, really. That's what it was. And in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. That guy is nasty. The next guy is in Matthew chapter 14. It's called Herod the Tetrarch, or Herod Antipas. He's a nasty guy, too. He lops heads. If you look at uh, Matthew 14, verse number 1, At that time Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus and said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. 
For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. <laughs> and when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude, because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John Baptist's head in a charger. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, for the oath's sake... And them which sat with him at me, he didn't want to be, you know, weak, he commanded it to be given to her. And he sent and beheaded John in prison. And his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. I don't think I want to hang out with anybody that wants people's heads in a charger. Can you imagine you're at a dinner and somebody's like, hey, give me a so-and-so's head in a charger. Sweet, that sounds awesome. And then the people that are around those type of people. You follow me how, how absolutely demonically possessed these people are to be wanting that type of stuff? How satanic this government is? This Herod is also uh, seen in the book of Luke in chapter number 23. He's the one that's there with Pilate. If you look at Luke chapter number 23, and we'll just read verses, uh, a couple of these verses. Uh, starting in verse 1, he says, And the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation. <laughs> really? He's perverting the nation? Do tell. And forbidding to give tribute to Caesar. Well, that's going to make him mad, right? <laughs> saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered and said, Thou sayest it. I love that. He's like, you just called me the king of the Jews. And he says, Then said Pilate to the chief priests and the people, I find no fault in this man. And they were and they were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. Good verse to show you where he teaches. Where does he teach? This is the end of his life, and where do they say he teaches? Jesus Christ taught all around the world, preaching the gospel. No, he says right here, he went throughout all Jewry. That's where, that's where he was, that's where he taught. And he says, and when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a uh, Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, this is something that, you know, judges really love to do, you know? Right. Oh, this is somebody else's jurisdiction? Oh, yeah, get, get that guy out of here. I don't want to deal with this stuff, right? Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at the time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. He just wants to see what he's doing. Your fame spread abroad. Let me see what you're doing. Then he questioned with him many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod, with his men of war, set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. Herod didn't believe. Herod was just, you know, you want to mock him. Want to see, show me these miracles that you're doing, right? And the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together, but before they were at enmity between themselves. Well, that's good. Jesus Christ brought friendship between two uh, opposing uh, rulers. So all of the Herods that we've seen thus far are all what? They're murderers. Not just murderers, they're also what? Persecutors of the faith. The Herod that we see here in, in Acts chapter number 12 is, is Herod the first, right? He's the grandson of Herod the Great. That, that's the one that's in Acts chapter, or Matthew chapter number 2. Like all the Herods before him here in Acts chapter number 12, he's filled with hate. He likes to murder. That was on his mind. Just so we can complete our study on the book of Herods, or the look of the not book of Herods, but of the Herods, let's look at the book of Acts, chapter number uh, twenty-five and twenty-six. Talks about Herod, and then you can go down and look at uh, look at verse number twenty-seven. He says, King Agrippa, who is also called Herod, he says, Believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. And Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and all together, such as I am, except these bonds. You know, there's more about this Herod that we'll study in, in chapter number 12, and, you know, we'll see how God reaches down and 
does a little, you know, dispensing of some wrath. Very interesting. Uh, one of the few times it happens in the dispensation of the grace of God. But he goes down and, and smites him because he makes himself a god to the people. But we'll make, uh, we'll make that uh, known when we get to that particular point. So this martyr here, uh, uh, James the Great, right? If you look at here, he's James the brother of John. We're going to study him out. We're going to figure out who this guy is. We're going to see who he is not. We're going to see the comparisons between all the Jameses. So basically, we're going to look at the. We're going to answer the following questions: How many James were there? Anybody have a? Have, anybody have a guess? I'm going to venture a guess to how many Jameses there are. You might be surprised. Number two, who really were all these Jameses? Three, were they all apostles? Four, were any of them of relation to Jesus Christ? Five, who wrote the book of James? Six, who is James in Acts chapter 15? Seven, who is James in 1 Corinthians 15? Eight, who is James in Galatians 1? It's important that we study these out and we'll we really will. Uh, I, I hope that we can maybe get a larger whiteboard because that's maybe what we're going to need. Uh, in all honesty, because I don't think I'm going to be able to break down all these verses without having a larger whiteboard. I mean, it's just not possible. I'd, we might have to get one. I'll purchase one on Amazon or something and get one because there's just too many. I mean, I have, if you saw the list, it's a lot. I'm going to read you a, the, the portion from the book of, uh, from the um, Fox's Book of Martyrs on James. It says this, The next martyr we meet with, according to St. Luke and the history of the Apostle of Acts, was James, the son of Zebedee, the elder brother of John, and a relative of our Lord. It's hmm. interesting. So this is going to be a very interesting study. Um, going to do with ever Virgin Mary? Yep, it's going to be pretty interesting. But for his mother, Salem, was cousin German to Virgin Mary. It was not until ten years after the death of Stephen that the second martyrdom took place. For no sooner had Herod Agrippa been appointed governor of Judea than with a view to ingratiate himself with them, he raised a sharp persecution against the Christians and determined to make an effectual blow by striking at their leaders. The account given us by an eminent primitive writer, Clemens Alexandrinus, ought not to be overlooked. That is, James was led to the place of martyrdom. His accuser was brought to repent of his conduct by apostles' extraordinary courage and undauntedness and fell down at his feet to request his pardon, professing himself a Christian and resolving that James should not receive the crown of martyrdom alone. Hence, they were both beheaded at the same time. Interesting. Thus did the first apostolic martyr cheerfully and resolutely receive that cup which he had told our Savior he was ready to drink. Timon and Parmenas suffered martyrdom about the same time. The one at Philippi and the other in Macedonia, these events took place roughly AD 44. I mean, you read that stuff and you're like, man, who's going to be doing that, you know? Um, that's some serious faith, you know? That's some serious faith and trust in who Jesus Christ, you know, says and is and says he was. Uh, it's 1040. In order to not get too crazy, uh, I will outline this out Uh we're going to unpack these verses, and if you want to, um, I, can, I can email you some lists of some verses that you guys can probably read uh, just to get going on this. I have quite a few lists here. Uh, there's a lot of them we have to go over. But I think this will be a really good study because, honestly, I've, I've not really heard anybody do it in detail. And, you know, are there some things that are complicated? Yeah, absolutely. Are there some things that require a lot of comparisons between and a lot of verses that you're going to have to compare? Yes. Um, and is there some gaps that are filled with um, other verses? Yeah, of course. So what somebody writes and what you know their intention is, uh, further information can be gave by reading other parts of what they wrote. So that's how we'll be doing this. So, all right, let's close in word of prayer. Uh, dear God, we thank you.